Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction and for the, invita the invitation to give this talk. I'm very happy to do it. And as Niva was mentioning in this talk, I will provide an overview on these uh, recent hints of new physics that we seem to be seeing in B physics data, the so-called uh, B physics anomalies. But before getting there, let me start with some brief introduction. As you all know, it's been already uh, more than 10 years since the LHC started operation. And so far, we have no uh, direct hints of any new physics, although we do have uh, many reasons to expect it. And as uh, you can already see in this uh, summary plot from Atlas, there are uh, many, many different models that have been tested already at the LHC whose uh, bound or whose mass scale seems to be pushed uh, beyond the TV scale, in some cases even closer to the 10 TV scale. In this situation, uh, it seems uh, almost clear that we might be facing a mass cap, and this is something that uh, I will talk in recurrently during this talk. And on the other hand, uh, this mass cap uh, seems, however, not to be too far. There are some hints in the low energy data that uh, if we are lucky, might be the first footprints of new physics. And I'm just highlighting here some of the experimental results that show deviations from the standard model uh, expectations, and I will go deeper into them. But before going there, I want to motivate even further. And to me, uh, right now, the situation in particle physics looks uh, very much alike to the situation of middle age Europe before the age of exploration. So basically by now, we have a fairly decent understanding of uh, the OR wall, the standard model. We do have some hints of something that might be beyond, but however, it's hard to reach for us because there is a mass gap that uh, screen us from it. And at some point we need to go and cross it to see this new physics if, if we are lacking. And indeed, uh, this presence of mass caps, it's something that it's not completely foreign to particle physics. It's indeed something that has already happened. And one clear example is that of the Fermi theory, where we already had a fairly good understanding of uh, some interactions that we knew later were mediated by the W boson. And actually at the time, we didn't even know, need to know that the W boson was underlying these, uh, these effects. And indeed, this is already hinting at the fact that uh, effective field theories are a very useful tool at dealing with these circumstances where we do have a mass cap. And it's something that I will also use extensively during my talk. One thing uh, one should also take into account is that uh, even though uh, one can have a very fairly good understanding of underlying uh, low energy imprints via the measurement of uh, High, uh, with some coefficients of higher dimensional operators, reconstructing a complete UV theory, it's actually a very hard task, basically because we are dealing with limited information and a priori there is no unique solution until we start seeing some direct, direct evidence. And indeed, it took more than 30 years to arrive to the standard model from the Fermi theory. So it's not gonna be an easy path, even if uh, these hints are actually pointing to something uh, new. Uh, as I'm arguing, uh, currently we are in a somewhat similar situation. Now we have uh, no, hint, no direct hint of new physics, which indeed seems to be pointing to a mass cap, where effective field theories are playing a very important role. And then we can actually replace the standard model by the analog of the Fermi theory for the standard model, which is the SMEF. However, if we try and do that, one problem one can see immediately is that there are many, many, many possible new interactions. And following a holistic path here, it's actually very hard because one has to constrain many different couplings. So even in the presence of hints of new physics, this becomes a very hard situation. Let me also mention before going further that actually the mass cap we saw between the heavier standard model particles and the bottom part, the next heavier, it's about 20 times, which is more or less in the ballpark of what we are testing now. So there might be a mass cap, and it's actually not um, something that we have not experienced in the past. So one should not get too depressed about this. On the other hand, uh, dealing with this situation of many new physics couplings, 
it's something that needs to be uh, treated in a coherent way. And indeed, one would expect that in principle, whatever new physics is lying in the skies will not populate all the Wilson coefficients with the same strength. So one could argue whether we could infer something about these Wilson coefficients from the ones we know, from the renormalizable terms in the standard model couplings. So this is something one could try, and indeed it has been a, a very important guiding principle for us, pre and post LHC. And it's good to remind, it's good to look back into the standard model and see what can we learn about new physics just by looking at these couplings. And indeed, uh, one can separate very nicely the, the standard model into several sectors. There is the, the kinetic terms that uh, do not seem to provide any information about possible uh, high energy physics. They just seem to be some low energy projections of, of the Lagrangian. But however, there are other two pieces the Higgs potential and the Yukawa sector that do seem to provide some UV information and indeed present several natural features. The Higgs higher frequency problem, well known for everybody, essentially tell us that there needs to be something that stabilizes the mass of the Higgs. And this something typically should be around the TV scale for this stabilization to take place. And on the other hand, another natural feature in a somewhat different way to that of the Higgs mass, it's the so-called standard model variable puzzle, where we see that there are very, very precise the structure, very different couplings in this uh, Yukawa sector that deviate strongly from the naive expectation of having them being order one. If we combine these two uh, hints together with a possible new physics extension, one very easily arrived to a picture that I find very appealing, which is a multi-scale solution to both the Higgs hierarchy problem and the Yukawa sector, in the sense that uh, uh, one could expect that whatever new physics is lying ahead, it's not generic at all. It's actually very specific when it comes to flavor. And as we probe deeper and deeper energies, we are sensitive to new physics that is more sensitive to the third family, second family, and first family. And in this way, one can immediately understand that the standard model Yukawas are very different because they origi originate at very different scales. In principle, the Yukawas are not enough to provide information about a definite scale because they are marginal couplings. But once we connect that with the Higgs uh, hierarchy problem, one can completely fix these energy thresholds to be around these energy scales I put here. This has several advantages from the uh, new physics point of view. One of them is that it immediately predicts uh, TV scale new physics that only coupled to the third family and to a lesser extent to the lighter families, which uh, immediately provides some flavor protection from very strong uh, flavor constraints, such as those arising in a uh, meson oscillation. As you can see already from this picture, I would expect the meson oscillation to be more prominent in, in the vis vis system, for example, which is way less constrained than the Kion system, for instance. Another advantage of this picture is that since uh, the couplings to the light families are expected to be lower, the direct production of new states at LHC, it's also more naturally suppressed, and therefore the new scale could be lower. So th this is a picture that I will have in the back of my mind when, when thinking about this data. And I will try and show you that the B physics data might be hinting at a picture that is somewhat similar to that. Sorry, so, Javier, yeah. can I ask a stupid question? So sure. when, you, when you mentioned these three scales, do they originate from the fact that whatever physics is above the standard model is just a structure of couplings that are different for different families or? How, yeah, how so do you the, generate the, something the idea here is that, uh, say, this threshold, for example, is physics that is dominantly coupled to the third family and has very little or nothing to do with the light families. As I go farther up, then I will see some other new physics that it's more, it's strongly coupled to the second family and so on and so forth. So it's really a matter of structure of the couplings of whatever theory is yeah. beyond the standard. Yeah, I, I will try to provide a, a more definite picture as, as we go through. Got it, thanks. Cool. Okay, so the, this um, thing here serves as, as an outline for the rest of the talk. 
And uh, basically, I will take you through the path from the data to a picture that very much looks uh, like this uh, energy thresholds. And of course, I will follow a linear path here. But uh, let, let me just uh, say as a warning that this, each of these steps is indeed complementary to each other. And the history along these years has not been linear at all. We have been going back and forth many times. OK, so uh, without further ado, let me uh, take a closer look at the data. And in particular, this. Uh, B physics anomalies, which are, nothing, which are nothing more than hints of lepton flavor universality violation in semi lepton lp decays. And there are indeed two types of hints. There is the so-called uh, B2SLL anomalies. This is a neutral current transition in the standard model mediated by a penguin diagram, a one-loop diagram. And uh, the data, I will go further into this, seems to hint as a, at a violation of a mu e universality. While on the other hand, we also have a hints of deviation from the charge current counterpart, B to C tau nu, which is, however, a three level effect in the standard model mediated by the W. And where now we seem to see a violation of universality in the taus versus the light leptons. So let me first focus on the neutral current anomaly, and I will go to the other one next. Concerning the neutral current anomaly, it's uh, good that I provide you some basic ideas of how, what to expect. Essentially, there are two things to be concerned about here. One is the short distance in electronic interaction. This is fairly easy to compute. And essentially, all I need to know about QCD is some form factors that can be extracted from data or even from first principles using lattice QCD. So in an ideal world where this is all there is, I would expect a generic uh, B meson decay into another meson to behave somewhat like this here. However, unfortunately for, for experimentalists and for us too, uh, real life is not like that. It's more complicated. And there is other type of interaction, long distance interaction, which becomes actually very important once we reach the champ threshold. So we can also have this type of uh, four fermion operators with a champ that uh, becomes highly non perturbative close to the champ mass threshold, leading to the uh, J psi and psi 2s resonances, which serve as a pollution, a QCD pollution, to any low energy measurement we try to make. So as you will see, most of the measurements take place in this low Q square region where the charm pollution is small. However, this charm pollution is something to, be, to, to take into consideration. And it's a, a, an unavoidable error that can be estimated, but uh, one has to take it into account. However, an important thing to mention here is that this long distance effect, this charm pollution, it's very specific in the sense that it's mediated by a photon, which induces a vectorial and lepton universal contribution. And therefore, this charm pollution cannot appear in anything that breaks lepton universality, the photon does not, or anything that has, uh, is given by an axial current contribution, since the photon is vectorial. And in particular, this means that this type of pollution cannot be present in pure leptonic decays, such as visa nu. So let me go to one of those uh, one of those places where this charm pollution cannot enter, and therefore will be theoretically clean. And these are again these violations of lepton flavor universality, where now I provide specific methods to this uh, quark lepton transition, in particular in B to K or K star L plus L minus. As I was arguing before, these are theoretically very clean because most uh, actually QCD uncertainties cancel in the ratio, leaving an error that is completely dominated by QED and that is at the 1% level. And again, this thing here, this 1.1 and 6, essentially means that the measurement of these branching fractions is done in this region here, where we expect the, where we expect the short distance physics to dominate and where new physics can compete. So you can see here the, the historical of, of the measurement of the RK ratio, where you have a, a B to a K and a pair of muons versus a B to a K and a pair of electrons. 
And you can see that there has been already several iterations of these measurements by LHCB with the latest one, 2021, already providing uh, evidence for lepton flavor universality with a 3.1 sigma deviation. There is also the, the vectorial counterpart, RK star, actually with the RK zero, RK star zero, which uh, was measured in 2017 and also present deviations at the level of 2 to 0.5 sigma. To this joins some recent measurements, in particular this one here, uh, later past year, with other uh, universality ratios, RPK, RK star plus, RK zero, which also say the show deviations, however, with much larger errors. As you can see here already, uh, this is a place uh, where we expect uh, updates. The, the last uh, updates ha happened in 2017. So it's something to stay tuned, this measurement of RK star zero. To these, to the measurements of uh, LFQB uh, ratios, we have also uh, other hints of new physics. In particular, another clean channel I was arguing before is uh, this ABS to mu mu. And here we see a 2.3 sigma deficit from the standard model expectations. You can see it here. To these joins uh, other channels in which again, only muons are involved, contrary to the universality ratios where electrons are also present, which are however, less theoretically clean because in here, this charm pollution is present. And in particular, there are also discrepancies in B2K star and new, new angular distributions and in uh, differential branching fractions of B to several uh, hadrons and a pair of muons. Remarkably, all this data taken together points to a very coherent new physics effect. So it seems to be something that goes together. It's not like a random fluctuation in which things cancel with each other. And indeed, one can take a completely global analysis, taking all possible Wilson coefficients entering into these effects and obtain a global 4.3 sigma significance for the new physics effects in B2SF using very conservative theory estimates where basically these charm loops are allowed to vary arbitrarily. One can go further and actually look for precise uh, new physics explanations. And I, I, can, I will do that in terms of an EFT. This is a weak effective uh, theory where the, the standard model, uh, the, the Higgs has already taken a depth. And in particular, I look into these two directions of EFT operators, one with a vectorial uh, current, which is uh, sensitive to these uh, charm pollutions and one with a uh, axial current. And in particular, I will only consider uh, clean observables. And therefore I will take this uh, difference between muons and electrons that is completely clean and not sensitive to, to these charm effects and plot together RK, RK star and visa to mu mu. If we now look to precise directions in this uh, EFT space, the significance of new physics actually becomes stronger and one finds uh, about a five, a five sigma preference for left-handed new physics. Once we have done that, we can go even further and actually extract the precise value that we get from this effective interaction to find that uh, we would need a, a ratio of coupling over mass of about 40 TeV. This is uh, concerning the, the clean observables, this uh, data that is not sensitive to chunk rescattering, which is plotted here in this one, in this other plot. I can put this together with the other B2S mini observables that are however sensitive to the chunk scattering. And as you can see, they are quite consistent with each other. However, uh, one should mention that the, the uncertainties happening in this side of the effect are more sizable, basically due to the fact that any universal signaling contribution, this is a contribution happening in both muons and electrons, could be fake by uh, this charm loop I was talking about. To the best of our knowledge, if uh, we do the best possible estimate of this charm loop, and there has been many, many works in this direction, you can see already by eye the significance of new physics is well over the five sigma. I will come back also to this uh, universal contribution later on. Sir Javier, can you uh, clarify? So uh, um, does a pure vector coupling work or no? A pure vector coupling could work as well. You see it from here already. Okay. 
right? So uh, this would be delta C9 mu. And it, it would actually provide a good fit as well, yes. For, for so that, 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 that would be basically exactly the operator that's induced in the standard model then. Right, right, this O9 here, yes. Right. Okay, so let me now move towards the, the charge current anomaly. The situation here is statistically way less significant as in the neutral current. In particular, let me first discuss the effect. So this, you can see here several measurements of similar universality ratios, now in charge current, B to D or D star tau nu over B to D or D star L nu, where L here is either a mu or actually a, a average of mu and electron. And as you can see here, there are several measurements by three competing experiments, uh, Bell, Bavar, and Bell 2. Uh, sorry, Bell, Bavar, and LCB. And uh, again, as it happened with the, the RK ratios, the QCD uncertainty is also canceled to a large extent in the, in the ratio. And you can see that by looking at the standard model prediction here, this tiny process here, to be compared with the current experimental sensitivity. The, errors is, the experimental errors are clearly much larger. You can also see that the agreement between experiments is not perfect. However, it's actually reasonably good. You can see the p-value, it's about 30%. And in this case, the tension is way lower. It's a 3.4 sigma tension when combining RD and RD star, which is, however, slightly reduced when considering a very recent measurements by, by Eric CB on, on this decay, uh, hadronic decay, lambda B to lambda C and mu. The errors here are very large. So the change in the significance is it's very small. It's probably changing it to 3.1 sigma or so. But however, this is the first measurement that it's on the other side of the standard model. It, produce, it predicts, uh, it shows a, a deficit of tau compared to all the other measurements. You can already see here that uh, actually the situation in particular for LHCB contains data that it's actually quite old and we should expect uh, many updates in this plot in the future, not only from LHCB, but also from Bell 2 and uh, eventually even from CMS, which is doing a hard effort to enter the game. Okay, again, I can do the EFT uh, game and try to uh, understand this uh, new physics uh, in terms of uh, EFT operators. And in particular, let me look into these two directions where I have an operator that is exactly of the same type as the standard model contribution via W and a different contribution where I have uh, a right-handed component for, for this uh, quark lepton current. And I'm putting everything in quark lepton. It might seem uh, strange at first, but it will be clear uh, as I go through the talk. And already you can see, so here is the data that there is a clear preference for left-handed new physics, again, while other new physics structures could a priori be possible. They are consistent with the data. However, you, know, you, you really seem to be going in towards, towards the direction of left-handed new physics. One can do the, exactly the same game of trying to extract the size of the Wilson coefficient. And in this case, one finds a way larger effect with the, um, the coupling over mass about 3T. So one thing we could immediately argue is whether there is anything to do between these two anomalies. And I want to argue, uh, I will argue in this talk that yes, there is actually quite a lot to do between them. However, as uh, you can see already, the effect predicted by the charge current anomaly is much bigger than the uh, corresponding one from the neutral current anomaly. There is another difference between the two, and it is that while the quark level transition involves the same flavor of quarks, the lepton level transition is very different in the sense that here we are touching taus, we are touching third generation leptons, while here we are touching second generation leptons. And indeed, keeping in mind this idea of connecting with the, with the Yukawa sector, the only source of lepton flavor universality that we have in the standard model, lepton flavor universality violation that we have in the standard model, the Yukawas, follow a very similar trend with the tau Yukawa much larger than the mu Yukawa much larger than the lepton Yukawa. So actually one can play a flavor game and one can enforce 
uh, Yukawa-like scaling for the new physics. And once you do that, immediately you arrive to TV scale new physics with suppressed couplings to the uh, second generations that uh, for the anomalies to be consistent should be in the 0.1 value, which is not too far away from the size you would infer from the standard model Yukawa, in particular from BCD. This can be done in, in more precise terms in using flavor symmetries, and it's something that we did here showing the consistency in the SMEF. This is actually very suggestive because it seems to indicate that the, this data seems to go well together and seems to point to some underlying flavor symmetry solution to the flavor passing. And therefore, even though the charge carrier anomaly is clearly less significant, it adds a lot to the coherent picture of having them both together. Another nice thing is that I can explain both data sets by adding simply one EFT operator, this one here, which again, I write in quark lepton currents. And indeed, uh, uh, by SE2 invariance, one can see immediately that this contributed to two, two types of effects. One would be neutral current, and the other one would be charged current. And the only thing I need to do for the same Wilson coefficient to work is to have a Yukawa-like scaling for the flavor. So the one I was arguing before. Once I do that, all the data is explained by this operator here, which can be fished into the more known uh, lepton quark currents. And one thing that I gain for free from this operator is that effects in B2S new new, which are actually severely constrained, are not generated by this. So if I put a minus sign here, I cannot have a coefficient with the same size as these ones here. I need something that it's way smaller. And I will provide a dynamical explanation for that. Another nice thing of having both data sets together is that once I have an effective operator, I can, I can actually look at particular transitions. And by AC2 invariance, I immediately see that there is a clear connection between the charge current anomaly and a very large effect in the B2S tau tau transitions. Basically, uh, here I don't pay any flavor suppression in the leptons compared to the ones that explain the RK. And while this is very hard to find in LHCB and also at Bell, uh, this can be uh, entered via RGE effects into uh, something that is very much similar to this charm loop. So it's a universal contribution, again, mediated by a photon, entering directly into the, into the low energy field. And actually, these type of effects provide a positive feedback between the anomalies that was predicted even before uh, this uh, evidence, uh, these hints of, uh, of such an effect was seen in the data. So let me put this plot I had before and just put it now in terms of these Wilson coefficients of the effective operator. And uh, this uh, good consistency I was showing before, now you see it more clearly here, where I also underlie the corresponding contribution from RT. Let me just mention that I'm choosing, a, a, it's a, just a choice, a basis where I'm aligned to the down quarks. And therefore, uh, for RD, which has up quarks, I need to do a CKN rotation. So that's why there is also a contribution from, from this Wilson coefficient here. So again, you see a good consistency between these. However, uh, there is also many other constraints to look at, and we have looked at them. And in particular, there is high PT data, PP to tau tau transitions, Trajan data, data with taus, which roughly scales like that. There is also tau LFUV test. I can do similar loops to the ones I was doing before to see modifications in tau decays. These are this band here. And more importantly, and very hard to estimate, I would also expect to have some corrections into B sub S, B sub S bar mixing. And this is something that within the EFT framework, I cannot really estimate properly. At best, I can do some cutoff uh, ninth dimensional analysis estimate. And indeed, just by doing that, I see that these effects are actually quite important. So they do not rule out the model for a lambda of one TV, but you can see that it's already putting some pressure. And this clearly calls for some deeper UV explanation, as I will uh, argue in the following. And I guess along these lines, even without talking about the tau loop, uh, if we just yeah. uh, naively said that the scale of new physics associated with these things was around where you need here, 
uh, the scale for the BB bar operated directly if we had Q bar Q squared was like 500 dV, right? So. Uh, yeah, so, so you see already, this is a, with a loop. Right, right, this is one loop down already. It's already uh, non-trivial, non, non right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah indeed, indeed. So that's 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 what's going to push you towards leptoquarks, I guess. That we're, we're going exactly. to exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So before getting there, let me just say a brief comment about G minus two. Uh, you also know it's been very recent uh, measurement by by the Fermilab collaboration confirming the Brookhaven result, which now seems to point to a, a strong evidence of new physics with 4.2 sigma. This prediction is actually very important, and I would be happy to incorporate into the other data sets. However, I will just argue in the next slide, and then it's hard. And um, one should also be careful on, on the standard model prediction, which, as suggested by Lattice, might be slightly different from the, from the standard model one. So similar to, to the fact that there are QCD pollutions, in some of the V physics uh, data, not in all of it, there could be also some pollution in, in this data here and something to consider. If I completely ignore that and just uh, look at the effect, one thing one can see immediately is that for an explanation to have, this uh, the effect we see, it's roughly the standard model electroweak contribution. So in order to explain such a big effect, new physics should be either light or it should not be chirally suppressed. Of course, it should be also uh, loop generated, which somehow departs from the type of new physics uh, I'm gonna argue uh, for the B physics. But even one could think, okay, maybe this thing combine both together. One thing one can face and one, one has to face, and it's actually what makes combining the two very complicated is that uh, in order to explain the data, in particular, the measurements of lepton field violation, the new physics entering in G minus two should be actually nearly flavor conserving. And you can see in particular in the mu sector, this alignment in the lepton sector should be way stronger than the naive expectations one would have from flavor. This is actually very challenging to put together with the anomalies. And in what follows, I, I will not consider this data set when describing uh, possible new physics interpretations. So, now that uh, we have some hints of new physics, let's uh, take our boats and, and, and look for some simplified uh, analysis, some simplified models. So uh, as Nima was already uh, uh, hinting at, if we look at uh, mediators that can explain these anomalies, and in particular are DRD star, one has basically two types. Uh, there is a, a, a leptoquark that connects a quark lepton current, so current color or a colorless mediator that if uh, there is a DRD star should contain at least some charged particles and W prime. And uh, there is a clear advantage on leptoquarks over the colorless mediators. Indeed, these leptoquarks generate uh, dangerous effects in four quark and also in four lepton transitions only at the loop level. While the, the corresponding colorless mediators do that at three levels. So this is a clear advantage. There is an additional advantage, and is that direct searches are also suppressed for leptoquarks when compared to the colorless particles, because production at delete C happens through T channel exchange rather than resonant S channel production. So clearly, the, there is a reason why leptoquarks have lived a renaissance uh, with this data. It's actually uh, the data really push in this direction if you want to have in Valparak of TV uh, new physics of this type. And there are, there are several leptoquarks one can consider. And from this table, you can already see that there is one that stands out. It's the only one that can explain uh, both anomalies uh, alone. And this is this uh, U1 vector leptoquark. It's a triple of color, singlet of SU2, and hypercharged two thirds. One can consider combinations of leptoquark that mimic the effect of, of, of this U1. But essentially, the main reason why this vector leptoquark is much more successful than the other leptoquarks has to do with the fact that, as I will show, it predicts no three level effect in B2S union. While the other ones need to conspire, it's not a huge tuning, but one needs to tune a couplings between different mediators to hide the effects here. So again, the data seems to be pointing in the direction of this vector leptoquark. 
And once we have this vector leptoquark, one can actually uh, has further hints. This is now a vector, so it naturally points to a gauge uh, new physical structure, as I, will, as I will argue, which can now be connected to flavor in a deeper way and even point to a third family qual lepton implication, as I will are, are you going to explain what's wrong with the scalars? Uh, I, I will not, uh, and it's actually, there is nothing wrong with this combination of S1, S3, and S3, R2. In a sense, the only thing that it's wrong, and it's not too wrong, it's that you need to tune the couplings of, of these two mediators to cancel B, B to S mu mu. Ah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, once you admit that, there is nothing wrong. And actually, you can mimic exactly the, low, the same low energy description of the EFT I was arguing before. For the vector leptoquark, you get that for free. So that, that's a bit nice. Okay. okay, so let me focus next in this uh, U1 vector leptoquark. This is the, the interactions of this leptoquark. You can see it here. And you already see that uh, if I forget for a minute on this right-handed interaction, this quark lepton current, in particular, this quark lepton current squared, is exactly the one entering in the EFT explanation I was discussing before. So there's actually a very nice one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. And indeed, one sees that this lack, uh, lack of B to S new new uh, transitions, it's simply a consequence of this leptoquark being a, a, an S2 singlet. If uh, we allow for a generic couplings of this leptoquark, when it's immediately dead, However, if we again put a Yukawa like uh, scaling for this, such as like this one here, so again, uh, order point one suppression for like families, one can have a very good description of all low energy data, which uh, what I will call natural flavor structure in the sense of being a Yukawa like. Now, uh, we have introduced a new particle into the game. There are many different new effects to consider. So as I go ahead, the game, the model building game becomes more and more complicated. However, I, I will not enter into the details. You can see that the, the explanation of the anomalies, which is now represented by these best fit points, one and two sigma, it's actually quite good, much better than the standard model, and we're consistent for our measurements. And this right-handed coupling here, while uh, possible, it certainly also provides a, a fairly decent fit it's actually provides a bit worse fit, but might be interesting for, for theoretical reasons to have it here. Once uh, we have a leptoquark, one can also look not only at low energy data, we can also start looking at high PT data and things become a bit more interesting. So we can go as, uh, and, and try and hunt this leptoquark at the Litzy. And there are essentially two ways one can look for it. One is fair production of leptoquarks. This happens uh, through gluons change, and it's fairly insensitive to the leptoquark coupling to fermions. This is basically QCB at play. While on the other hand, we can also have a drill jump P channel change, which will distort the tau tau tails in drill jump, which, uh, as I was arguing before, it happens at the P channel, and therefore it's a bit harder to see. So we have taken this data from CMS and recast the corresponding one from Atlas, and you can see these are the constraints. Together with the low energy fit, one gets where uh, high PT physics has not been included. So these uh, orange bands here would correspond to the low energy fit I was seeing here. And as you can see, high PT already provides some interesting complementary information and has the potential with the high luminal C to even fully prove the uh, relevant region in the parameter space for both. Uh, right-handed coupling to zero and right-handed coupling uh, maximum. And you can already see that indeed high PT is actually a bit uh, more uh, constraining for this second case. Okay, so this concerning simplified models, let me now discuss something more about UV completions. This U1 is a vector and therefore being a vector, a natural UV completion for it, it's to think of it in terms of a gate symmetry. And it's uh, indeed uh, nice that uh, when one thinks about possible UV completions for the le this leptoquark, the smallest group that contains it is SU4. 
which naturally points to the Pattison group. This is a very nice group that predicts uh, quark lepton unification. Uh, as the, the title of the paper uh, says, leptons are, are seen as a fourth color. Uh, and this actually, this U1 leptoquark, it's, it's the first leptoquark that was, uh, even pro that was uh, proposed. It was only proposed only seven years after the standard model was proposed. So it would be beautiful if uh, Patti Salam would explain this data. However, unfortunately, uh, life is not so good. Good. This uh, vector leptoquark cannot explain the data. And the, the reason being that the uh, Patisalan group is completely flavor blind. And in particular, uh, the flavor blind U1 uh, would mediate flavor processes such as scale on to mu e that puts the scale of this leptoquark very far away, uh, past the 100 TV threshold. And clearly, I was talking about the TV scale in physics. It's something I, I cannot afford to explain anomalies. Not even the, the neutral current one that at best was uh, 30. One can try uh, and hide this type of flavor blindness into mixing with fermions, and people have tried. But this is something that is not very successful because just by, by looking at the closure of the algebra, together with the leptoquark, one also needs to have a set prime. And this set prime uh, cannot be uh, cannot be taken away. So the, the, these tricks one can play with fermions to to hide the flavor the flavor blindness cannot be applied to the set prime. Similarly to to why the the, the set doesn't see the the, the CKM matrix, and therefore a strongly coupled universal set at the TV scale would be excessively produced at the C, and this would completely block the model. So the way to, to go beyond that, to protect the light families from this uh, type of new physics, is to actually decorrelate the SU4 group from the standard model color group by taking a flavor universal patisalan group and deconstruct the color part into SU4 cross SU3. So now it's 4, 3, 2, 1. In a very similar way to what happens with the electroweak sector, where the electric charge is deconstructed into two groups. So now, if we admit that, and in part, that already provides a, a, a separation between the gluon and the, and the color octet living in this SU4. And in particular, if we have a, a non-trivial flavor embedding of, of this uh, group, one can decorrelate the gluon, uh, the, the the leptoquark from the light families. Let me just mention that uh, in this setup, color arises as the diagonal of this SU4 and SU3, while hypercharge arises as the diagonal of this uh, SU4 and U1. And together with the leptoquark and set prime that we, had, we were having before, there is now a new mediator, this uh, G prime, which is essentially a heavy glow. So this is a price to pay. We, we managed to decorrelate the set prime and the leptoquark from the light families at the expense of making this G4 coupling larger than the G3. So we need couplings of roughly three or so. But the price to pay is a new particle, which is like a heavy gluon. This heavy gluon is also flavor non universal So it's harder to see at the lead C, but actually it provides the, the strongest constraints at high PT. So I can produce it at high PT. And you can see here the corresponding bounds that range from uh, 3.5 to 4 TB, depending on this kappa parameter that essentially control uh, how strongly this couple, coupling to the, to the light quarks is. And you can see that the, the best constraint here is uh, on, on PP to top top quantity bar. And this actually, it's uh, setting the, the overall scale of the model. So this is one of the most important high PT signals, where eventually with the enough accumulated data, one, one should see something if anything of this is true. Let me be a bit more precise on the model. And let me consider a particular realization of 4321 models. Not all of them have to be like that, but this is particularly suggest suggestive because it, because it provides a third family quark lepton unification. So let me abandon the idea of complete unification for now. And let me instead do unification a la Patti Salam only for the third family. So this is what you see here. The third family is put 
into partisan and multiplex, while the rest of the standard model, the first and second family, are put into um, a standard model like multiplex. In this way, we have a explicit realization of uh, this first layer of the multi-scale picture, where now there is a new threshold of new physics happening roughly at the TEB, which is mostly sensitive to the third family only. Now, in particular, I, would, I, I also need this lepto quark to couple to like quarks and like leptons, because I also wanted to explain, I wanted to explain anomalies. And also, the, in this model, the, the Higgs coupling to, between the third family and the other families is forbidden by gauge symmetry. So I, I need to introduce a breaking of that. And the 4, 3, 2, 1 breakings scalar, uh, scalars already provide that, provided I also include some vector like fermions. So these vector like fermions are needed, and they are needed to induce this mixing between the third family and the light families. The nice thing about that is that CKM mixing and new physics couplings to, to light families are connected by the same type of new physics. So again, we see this deep connection between uh, the Yukawa sector and the new physics, uh, the new, the next new physics uh, sector. A nice thing about this is that now I have a full UV complete model, so I can do looks, and I can finally address these problems of delta F equal to transitions and even delta F equal one. So uh, the thing I want you to keep in mind is that uh, in this model, this uh, U1, it's basically like a W, and this G prime and Z prime are basically like a set. So many of the intuition from flavor physics on a W and a set kind of happened here. And in particular, I can have uh, delta F equal one processes, like the ones happening in the standard model, mediated by a lepto quark, which now plays the role of a W, and a heavy lepton, this L, which is an element of this uh, chi multiplet, this chi multiplet here, which now, if you want, plays the, plays the role of a, a quark, say the top quark of the chunk quark in the, in the standard model analog. So I can do these loops. These are, are not computable. And uh, this has to me new. It's one of the facts that I was arguing it's uh, not there at the tree level, but at the loop level, it's generated. And there is a very pristine prediction of uh, B2K nu nu that will actually be a very, very important test of this type of combined solutions. And not even of this type, also for the scalar leptoquarks, a precise measurement of B2K nu nu it's putting a very strong test on, on the combined explanation of anomalies. And as you can see here, this dash line, Bell 2 with the full accumulated luminosity will be able to test that at the 10% at the level. So it's gonna be a, a very important complementary probe. Also quite interesting, it's the loop effects uh, in delta F equal two. Again, similar in the standard model, one will have uh, W boxes. Here they are U1 boxes. And very similar to what happens in the standard model with the gene mechanism, there is some sort of gene mechanism at play here where uh, the, the ultraviolet uh, divergence of this loop, it's truncated by the mass of the electron running inside the loop. And this is quite cool because for fixed uh, RD star anomaly, I have an automatic upper bound on the mass of this lepton in the very same way in which the chunk quark was predicted in the standard model. So you have a complete analog between the electroweak sector and, and this new colorful sector. And in particular, I predict um, vector leptons that should be uh, not, not he much heavier than the T. These uh, vector leptons are very specific in the sense that uh, the largest decay actually happens through an off-shell leptoquark, which immediately translates into the case of, of these leptons into third generation fermions and three of them. So it's actually a, a very unique uh, high PT signature that was not looked at before. This can be produced, by the way, through the usual mechanism by electroweak uh, exchange or also by the set prime of the model. And this type of search, we actually uh, went together with experimentalists and asked them for look at it, to look at it. And very recently, actually last week, uh, CMS collaboration provided the first uh, uh, search in this direction. And they show, you can see it already here from this uh, Brazilian plot, that uh, actually there, there seems to be an excess in the data. It's not too large, it's uh, 2.8 uh, uh, sigma, which seems to indicate some preference for these vector-like leptons. 
So it's uh, somewhat amusing that the, the lightest particle of the theory that is predicted, this vector like lepton, uh, we were expecting it to be uh, ruled out uh, up to certain mass. It's actually uh, preferred uh, by current data. This mass here, it's just a representative. You can see already from here that uh, the search is actually quite insensitive to the, to the mass. There is also only a very mild sensitivity to the mass. And once we include uh, some other production channels, like this set prime, we would expect a, a somewhat larger mass, and not much larger than this. But doesn't the sensitivity just uh, through electric production like uh, drop off around 1.3, 1.4 TV or something? Even so you, you can see it here by this red line, I should have mentioned. By this red line theory prediction is right. the computation of the cross section, sure. including only electroweak production. Right, right. So you see it drops very fast with mass. Sure. Um, by including the set prime, it will be it will be shifted and actually slightly different because I can hit a, some resonant production with the set prime. But even with the high, high luminosity LHC, it's like uh, not not even one and a half TV, right? Thirteen hundred GV or something. Right, right. So if, if we have any lack, it better if we have any chance of seeing it, it better be light. Yeah, sure. If it's in the upper threshold, it's very very, very hard to be found. Yeah. Okay, so let me just um, conclude with some speculations about the deeper UV. And in particular, let me connect all these ideas of 431 symmetry, connecting with connection with flavor in terms, uh, in terms of a, an attempt of a full theory of flavor where I will embed the 431 group into a compact warp uh, ex extra dimension, ADS5, where now I trade off these um, multiple scales I was showing you in the, in the initial picture in terms of multiple brains. So the idea now is that these lambdas I put in, in the very beginning in the introduction are now replaced by some four dimensional brains with energy scales of about uh, 10 TV, 10 to the 3 TV, 10 to the 5 TV, which are in one to one correspondence with flavor. So in this picture, somehow flavor becomes really a, a fermion localization in the in the brains, somewhat similar, but not quite to the useful RS, because now uh, second families uh, are located in their own brain. And the third family, it's as usual in, in the infrared. The, the Yukawa one gets from this picture is this one you see here, where there's the usual exponential suppression, but together with the usual RS factor, there is also this additional factor, which has to do with the fact that the, the the second family actually lives somewhere in the middle of this uh, compact dimension. One uh, idea one can put further here is that the same dynamics that break uh, 4321 could also generate the Higgs as a pseudo number Wolfson boson, providing a stabilization of the electroweak hierarchy with a permit tune. So, this is the usual little hierarchy. Um, I, I just have a couple more slides and I will conclude. Let me just comment on, on how this, uh, this can happen in more precise terms. And for that, uh, it's nice to look at the, at the 4321 um, symmetry in the eyes of uh, the electroweak symmetry. So as you all know, in the limit of vanishing gates and Yukawa couplings, the Higgs sector can be described by a two-side model, where I have SU to left, cross SU to right, global symmetry, and a maximal subgroup, as you to left cross you one right, that is gauge, with a global SU2 vectorial through the spontaneous breaking. And the gauge that survives this spontaneous breaking, it's uh, basically QED, you won't be in this case, yielding the three uh, Goldstone bosons that are eaten in the standard model by the W and the C. Now, in this, uh, more con in this uh, deconstruction of color, now, in 4-3-2-1 models, also color goes through a similar process, where now the global symmetry is SU4H cross SU4L, where H only sees heavy fermions, L only sees light fermions, similar to L left only seen left-handed, right only seen right-handed. And again, this global symmetry can be gauged by a maximal subgroup of this type. This is now almost 4-3-2-1, in 4321, the two side models are connected by a diagonal gauging of these U1s. So, this is just a, a different way of looking at these 4321 models that I think it's, it's a bit amusing. 
And in, a same, in the same way, the spontaneous breaking of this SU force to the diagonal gives exactly 15 Goldstone bosons that are the ones that would be eaten by these heavy vectors. So this is something that can be very easily realized in this multi-scale picture, simply by having this symmetry here. So we can have a bulk symmetry, SU4 plus SU4 times SO5, so the minimal composite Higgs. And now there is also a unification of the light families in the Patisalan sense that can be broken sequentially as we go through this bulk to um, SU4 cross SU3 cross SU1 cross SU5 here. And finally, in the infrared by SU3 cross SU1 cross SU4, yielding exactly 15 plus 4. So doing this type of breaking here, that would give mass uh, to, this, to the 40 to 1 gauge bosons, and at the same time, uh, provide a, a, so the, a, a minimal uh, so the number of some Higgs. No, number of some boson Higgs. And with this, this is my last slide. Um, one can even take this uh, analogy further and look into cosmology for that. And as you can see, uh, once we reach each of these uh, brains, there is a, a first order, so there is a phase transition, which uh, can actually be seen to be a strongly first order, which would be a yield to some gravitational wave spectrum that would be between in the reach of future experiments. So again, there is a very strong complementarity between many different realms. Of course, of course, uh, as I go deeper into the UV, things become more and more speculative, but it, it's kind of nice that there, there is uh, all these different data set. And with this, I, I conclude. As I have already argued, the statistical significance for the LFU uh, anomalies, particularly in the neutral current, keeps growing. And already uh, with clean observables alone and in a specific physics direction, give five sigma. The situation is somewhat uh, less clear in B2C town new, and we need more, more data. This will come hopefully soon. But however, this uh, data set point to TV scale new physics, which in combination with B2SLR, suggest a new physics flavor structure that is similar to the standard module cards hinting at a possible connection uh, to the standard model favor hierarchies, which I have already explicitly realized in terms of this uh, 5D setup. New physics solution is consistent with low energy and high energy. However, uh, new physics effects should emerge soon in several observables. There are already some hints. And one very important caveat of many of the things I have uh, said here is that uh, this particular, this TV scale, TV scale new physics relies strongly on, on RD, RD star, which is uh, actually the weaker. There is, however, plenty of upcoming measurements. Uh, LHC round two data is still to be analyzed for many observables. So next, uh, this year and next year, we should see many more data on this physics. And Bell 2 data, it's starting to reach the same level of sensitivity as Bell. So again, we, we can see some flavor data coming from this. And with this, I want to conclude. Let's hopefully in the next year uh, reach uh, land. We'll see. But uh, I want to finish with this picture. Thank you. Thanks uh, so much, uh, Javier. Um, are there any questions now? Uh, I uh, uh, remind you all that we will have um, uh, the usual for the locals um, uh, uh, informal discussion uh, at 4 o'clock. Uh, with uh, uh, Javier, but uh, any uh, any global questions now? Maybe can I ask a super stupid question? I don't know if it's uh, but imagine that this is a thing that you have a, you have a laptop work at say one TV or or whatever. Um, do you know if this can have any implication for like dark matter, for example? There, there are some studies in this direction where one the, one puts together uh, dark matter with these models. However, I have to say that the dark matter explanation in this setup is as natural as it would be in the standard model. So there, there is no natural dark matter candidate in these setups, and one has to add it by hand on top of this story. So yeah. So it, uh, it, it, it could no, not be uh, the lowest lying. Uh... No, no, it's not like sushi. There, there is no clear candidate for dark matter in this setup. Got it. OK. Thank you. Sure. Uh, when you're feeling skeptical, if that ever happens, how would you try to 
reproduce these anomalies from systematic errors? Is there, is there what you regard as a most likely way? Right, so uh, I guess one of the, the criticisms one could have in these B2SLL transitions, for example, is that it's a single experiment. It's LHCB. Um, they're doing many different channels, different analysis, different people, but still there could be some systematics. I think all these uh, uh, doubts will go away uh, once we have Bell 2, so another competing experiment, which is completely different. It's going to be uh, actually electron positron uh, transition, uh, electron positron collider at very low energy compared to LHC. So uh, I think once, if the Bell 2 sees similar uh, effects, I think it's a very clear case for mu physics. Mm -hmm. Remind us what you said about the time scale for Bell 2. Yeah, so Bell 2, it's reaching by summer, similar statistic to that of Bell. Uh, let me remind you, just by looking at this plot, that Bell did that not- That was already high, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah. first, uh, let me remind you that Bell did not do a very good job at the measuring the B2SLN, because it's a red mode. It's very hard to see. So to see this, we need to wait a few years, probably two, three. But for the other anomaly, for the charge current, Bell actually already started providing some relevant information, which uh, should happen hopefully by, by next, next year or so. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? All right, if there are no other questions, let's uh, thank uh, Javier again, and um, at least some of us will see him again in uh, 25 minutes. Thanks a lot.